welcome to everyone this morning. And if you're a guest with us today, we are so glad to have you in service with us this morning. We welcome you. If you're watching us online today. We welcome you as a part of the service wherever you are. Good to have Brother Charlin and his dad in service this morning. We've been praying for him over the last several months. Been through a lot of challenging health issues, and it's so good to have him in service with us today. Good to see Jordan and Sadie visiting from Michigan. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter number 14. I want to read one verse there and then flip over a couple of chapters. Read a few more verses. 1 Samuel 14, verse number 6. Just a really quick context here. The children of Israel, they're in a standoff with the Philistines and basically everybody, all the soldiers and everybody sitting around. I think you could say sort of just having a pity party. And Jonathan basically decides that enough is enough. And so he and his armor bearer decide to go over and just see what might happen. And so verse 6 and Jonathan, Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And then going over to chapter 17 and verse number 23, no doubt one of the most well-known stories of the Bible. If you went to Sunday school very much, you heard this story. So I don't think I have to give a whole lot of details. 1 Samuel 17, verse number 23. And as he talked with them, behold, and speaking of David, as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. You know, you're pretty scared when, it's, when you're sore from being afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to, de surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth? The Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine Philistine? Jonathan said, Let's go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. And David says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I want to preach to you this morning on this subject, the context of covenant. The context of covenant. And I can just sense how in awe of you are of that title and what that means. So hopefully by the time we get done, it'll mean something. Praise God. Father, thank you for your presence in this place today. Thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to be together. Thank you for the work that your spirit is already doing here, how you've already ministered this morning. But I trust and believe that there is more you want to do and that you want to speak to hearts and lives in this place today. So I pray, God, that there would be faith to hear and receive what you would say to us this morning. Let our hearts be open to receive what you would desire to say. Father, I trust you this morning that you would speak to us. 
Lord, we don't need the words of man. We don't need just a good speech. We need to hear something from you. And so I trust you that you will allow me to be a messenger this morning that you would speak through. I depend upon you today. I trust you for your anointing in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I have to tell you that until just a couple of weeks ago, I, I think as I read this verse, have heard this verse, I've used this verse preaching, I've just kind of brushed right over it. But I think there's something very significant in, in David's uh, question to those who were gathered around when he says to them, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? I said my title is the context of covenant, and so the, the word context, not an unfamiliar word, but, but the word context, according to Webster's Dictionary, is the interrelated conditions in which something exists or occurs. So when David asks the questions he's asking, but in particular asks this question, he was, perhaps if for no one else, he was establishing the context of what was taking place and what he was about to do. How many of you think or believe that the story of David and Goliath is one of the greatest stories of an underdog overcoming in all of history? Anybody, anybody believe that this morning? Anybody think that? There goes my trick question for 2022. I think many people are of the opinion that the story of David and Goliath was the story of an underdog because Goliath is this giant of a man and he is skilled in warfare and here comes this kid somewhere in his late teens I I said to my our family chat the other day you know we're in this new phase now of married children I said you might as well get used to still being referred to as kids I'm 50 years old and I still get referred to as my dad and mom's kids so Kid is not about age, it's about position or, you know, relationship. So, but but here, here is this kid, just a shepherd boy. He's just come with some, some cheese and bread to deliver them to his, his family and find out for his dad what's going on. And, and he walks out there with a sling and some stones to face this giant. And so, therefore, this is this great story of an underdog. But it really wasn't. You see, I, I, I feel like if you believe it's the story of an underdog, then probably the way you have to imagine it is David went out there on the battlefield and he puts, the, he puts a stone in his sling and he begins to swing it around with his eyes closed and he's praying, Oh, Jesus. we got a light show this morning. Oh, Jesus, please let this, let this, let this stone hit the right spot. It's not what he was doing. David walked out there, and, 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 and it's, there's more to it than just this, which is where I'm getting in, in just a moment. But David walked out there with confidence. And, and if I could tell you, he really walked out there first and foremost with confidence in God. But he also walked out of there with some confidence in himself because the using of a sling was not just something that, that he did just at the spur of the moment. He was skilled. The Bible talks about, I, I think the word in the King James is slingers. I don't think that, that almost sounds like it could be something bad, but it's, it's not. Slingers were people that were skilled with using a sling. And, and there's one place in the Bible that says they could hit a target within a hair's breadth. They, they were marksmen. So that, that stone finding that small spot in Goliath's armor was not just this chance thing. David had been training and preparing. He didn't know that he was training and preparing to kill a giant. 
If you're if you're a visitor today, I, this is my first time to preach in I think almost a month, so I'll try not to make up for all that this morning. But here we go already. He didn't know when he was out there by himself tending his father's sheep, learning how to use that sling. He did not know he was being prepared to slay a giant. Some of you don't understand the monotonous things God has you going through right now. You don't understand what He's preparing you for. And so if you miss the opportunity and the lesson when it comes time to slay the giant, you won't be ready and the giant's going to slay you. He walked out there with confidence that he knew how to use that sling and he knew how to hit his target. It wasn't the story of an underdog. I I heard somebody just say this. I've heard it in the past, but I was listening to to a a message this week and somebody referenced this and and, and the person that they said said this, I have a lot of respect and admiration for. I don't consider myself better than them, but I've I've heard people say that faith is spelled R-I-S-K. I'm here to tell you this morning, I don't think that's a biblical statement. I don't think faith is spelled R-I-S-K. The only way faith is spelled R-I-S-K is you're trying to believe for something you don't have a word for. But when God has told you what He's going to do, there is no risk. When Peter said to Jesus that day when they were in the, on the storm in the sea, and Peter said to Jesus, Lord, if that's you, bid me to come. Peter did not take a risk when he got out of the boat. The Lord said, come. So that come was a guarantee that if you'll take the step, Peter, I got you. I'm going to take care of you. And so faith is not a risk because when you have a word from God, there is no risk. And and so David walked out there that day. Again, he had a confidence in himself. Not a cockiness or an arrogance. Not not talking about pride. But, But he had a confidence in who he was and what he knew how to do. But but really that was secondary. Because the context that he went out there in, and when he makes this statement, this is an uncircumcised Philistine, what he was saying was, he is not a part of the covenant that I am a part of. He doesn't have the backing on his side that I have on my side. So while I'm about to use this sling and this stone that I know how to use, I've also got something bigger that's coming behind me. And so he knew that he was in a covenant, and because of a covenant, he had confidence. Oh, hallelujah. Now I, I I need you I need you to bear with me for a few moments because I, I don't want to get too bogged down this morning, but you, you gotta you gotta have a little context. Because I, I said this, I performed a wedding this past Wednesday night, and I said it in the wedding ceremony that, that there are some words from the from scripture that that we use today, but or 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 actually there's some words in scripture that we have some synonyms for today. And, and we have essentially replaced those words with, with words that we're used to. And, and there's two examples of that. And the one in the context of, of the wedding ceremony the other night was when you get married, you make vows. And, and in 2022, I think we have a tendency to think of a vow as a promise. And if you've ever been in a wedding ceremony that I've done, I say it just about every single time I perform a wedding ceremony. The problem with that is there is a phrase that many of us are familiar with that promises are made to, vows are not made to be broken. The Bible says you're better to never vow a vow than you are to vow a vow and then to break it. So a promise and a vow are not the same thing. And the other word, so vow, the other word to me that's very much like that is the word covenant because in 2022 we are more familiar with the word contract. 
And while there are some similarities between a covenant and a contract, there is, they are not the same thing. A covenant has a whole nother level of, of, of stuff to it. According to the dictionary, just the good old regular dictionary, a covenant is the conditional promises made to humanity by God as revealed in Scripture. It is the agreement between God and the ancient Israelites in which God promised to protect them if they kept His law and were faithful to Him. And so you got to understand that the relationships God gets in are covenant relationships. And, and, and so part of the difference between a covenant and a contract is and, and especially in the context with regards to God, is if you breach a contract. We got a bunch of wonderful, awesome people, so I'm sure none of you have ever breached a contract. But I'll, so I'll ask it this way. Have any of you ever had somebody that breached a contract with you? Here's the deal. If somebody doesn't keep up the contract, they don't cease to exist to be them. I mean, the bottom line is there are businesses that have breached their contract that are still businesses. They may not have five stars on Google anymore, but they're still a business. But in particular with regards to God, if God does not keep His covenant, it's not just, eh, sorry. There are things in Scripture that let us know if God breaks the covenant that He makes, then He ceases to be God. So the, the purpose of that is not to be afraid that one day God may break a covenant. The purpose of that is to have absolute confidence that He is God. Therefore, He will never break the covenant because if He breaks it, He's not God anymore. And I know He's God, so He's going to keep the covenant. Oh, I, I, I'm, 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 I've said this in various ways throughout the years, but I'm so I'm, I'm so concerned that we miss the significance of what we're doing, of what we're a part of. Because some of you, even some of you that claim to be apostolic, coming to church is just, it's just a part of your life. It's not life. It's just a part of it. That's why it's so easy for you to, you know, to prioritize other things because it's just, if you're in a covenant... If you understand the significance of what you're in, that, that is the priority. Next to Jesus Christ, my relationship with my wife is the number one relationship priority-wise. If as those of you that I'm your pastor, you don't like that, I'm sorry. But my relationship with you as your pastor is not my number two priority behind God. I never made vows to you. But I made vows to her. And so every, basically, usually more subconsciously, but everything I do every day is affected by my relationship with God and my relationship with my wife. That's what a covenant does. And when you are born again, I'm going to come back to this in a little bit, but when you are born again, you are entering into a covenant with Him. You're not just signing up for the membership of a club. You are entering into a covenant. The good news of that is when you enter that covenant, if you'll keep your side of the covenant, there are some amazing things that He promises to do on His side of the covenant, which is the reason why David was making a proclamation that he is an uncircumcised Philistine, meaning he isn't a part of the same covenant that I am a part of. First, the first mention of the word, in, at least in the King James and the English, 
And if I'm not mistaken, even in the Hebrew, it's the first place. But the first mention of a covenant in the Bible was with regards to Noah. It's found in Genesis 6 and verse 18. And the Lord says, But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. He was saying, listen, if you'll do your part, if you'll build this boat, sounds crazy. you, you got to understand, at that point in time, there was no rain. It may not rain sometimes, but we know what rain is. So here goes this crazy guy starting to build this monstrosity of a boat and telling people it's going to rain. It's going to do what? You know what's a scary thing about us today? When Noah preached that it was going to rain and judgment was going to come, they had no basis other than just simply hearing what he said. But you and I have some witnesses. So you might want to be careful when the preacher gets up and says some things that may not fit with the norm. If they're based on the Word of God, you might want to double check the witnesses. So he builds this boat and does his part, trusting that God will do his part. And so God says, I'm entering into a covenant with you. Anybody got some people in your life, even some friends? Not just but people you consider to be friends, that when you make plans to do something with them, you are, you are really skeptical as to whether or not they're really going to happen. Because they've got a pattern that... You know, you, you plan dinner, and, 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 and sometimes it's a couple days before. Other times it's not too long before. Hey, I'm, I'm really sorry I hadn't. So some of you, you reach the point, you're like, you know, I'm going to plan it, but I didn't even put it on the calendar because I know it's not going to happen. God was trying to tell Noah, I want you to know you can count on me. That if you get into this relationship with me, Noah, you can count on me. Because I, I, I don't say what I say frivolously. I, I don't throw out promises that are to be broken. I am, I am making you a commitment, and that commitment is essentially based on my deity. And if I don't fulfill it, I can't be God. Oh, my goodness, what you and I are doing here today is so much better bigger than we comprehend it's so much bigger than we comprehend and so the the, the the second time there's a few other references with regards to Noah where God talks about this covenant and it's in there with regards to Noah that he says that's why you watch these movies about these disastrous floods or whatever that destroy if you watch those don't sit there worried about that's going to happen. It's not going to happen. God made a covenant that he would never again destroy the earth by water. Doesn't say it's not going to get destroyed by some other things, but you don't have to worry about water. He made a covenant with him, and there was a sign that has now been perverted. God was the originator and determine what a rainbow represented. And it represented his promise that he would never again destroy the earth with water. So then, a little bit later, we find the next, and, and really in some ways, to me, what is the more significant in the context of us today, the, 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 the next covenant that we find, it has to do with Abraham and, and the first mention of Abraham, and it's still as Abram, is in Genesis chapter 11. And then the, the story of Abraham really begins in Genesis chapter 12. And so it's in Genesis chapter 15 where God is he's already began dealing with Abraham and calling him to leave where he was and go out to this place that God is going to give him. And so in chapter 15 and verse number 8, the scripture says, And he said, Abram said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? 
the land that you're promising me. And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece on and laid each piece one against another, and the birds divided he not. Now, just, just kind of put a mental note there. We're going to come back in a moment with some of the significance of, of, of why Abraham did that. And then skipping down to verse number 17, And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. And so let me, let me, let me read a little bit here because, again, it'll, it'll give you a little bit of a understanding of what the significance why he did that in verse number 10 James at Fawcett and Brown says this a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces in explanation of this transaction it is necessary to observe that on occasions of great importance when two or more parties joined in a compact the ancient custom was to ratify the covenant or treaty by sacrifice which was offered in the following manner. The carcasses of the animals was to be used in the sacrificial rite were the, the carcasses of the animals to be used in the sacrificial rite were divided into halves, which were arranged on two separate altars erected opposite to each other. Then the parties between whom the covenant was made passed in the in, in, in the intermediate space with the severed pieces of the victim lying on either side of them as a symbolical act by which they oblige themselves to the covenant by all their hopes of peace and prosperity or imprecated the divine vengeance on their own heads in the event of their altering or violating the terms of the treaty. The scene terminated by the consumption of the sacrifice. And so when... Abraham did this. He was, he was participating in something that was familiar to them that was going to be the, the demonstration of the sealing of this covenant. Although, and I don't have time to really get into it today, but what's very interesting is I read to you when two humans did this, that in essence, they were equal parties that were making this covenant. And so they both would pass through these animals that had been set out. But if you notice what I read to you, it says that this smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed through. Meaning that when God made this covenant with Abraham, Abraham and God did not do the normal custom. Because in this covenant, it wasn't equal parties entering into the covenant. Oh, hallelujah. Because there's nobody equal to God. Beside Him, there is no other God. And so rather than God and Abraham doing what was the normal custom, God does what was necessary to, to demonstrate the confirming of the covenant. Basically saying, I got this. Also, he was saying, Abraham, you don't have what it takes to keep this covenant. Oh, hallelujah. You, you don't have, Abraham, what it, I know in advance. I know, I know from the moment I'm getting ready to make this covenant with you, you do not have the ability to keep it. But I'm going to make it with you anyways, knowing this. Whatever you lack. Oh, I, 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 whatever you lack, whatever mistakes you're going to make, 
I'm not going to break the covenant because I know in advance you can't keep it. But I'm going to make it with you anyways, knowing that not only am I going to have to keep my side of the covenant, but I'm also going to have to make up for your side of the covenant. If you've made some promises to God that you failed with, don't think for one second that God is surprised that you've messed up on some of your promises. If you told God some things you were going to do and you haven't kept your end of it, don't think God is shocked by that. He knew from the beginning, and from the beginning, He provided everything necessary that when you messed up on your side of the covenant, He would still keep. It really didn't take Abraham that long to mess up. God knew that from the beginning, and so He confirmed with Abraham covenant and and again and I, I've got some some more here I'm gonna I'm gonna skip it for the sake of time about a covenant and 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 more about this idea that what they did with the animals that part of that was to say if you don't keep your side of this let this basically get done to you it, it's more than just a oops my bad Ooh, I forget who it was. Somebody, I think it's probably somebody here this morning. You don't have to acknowledge it, you, if you don't want to. But the other night at that, I think it was the other night at the, the wedding reception. They ran. Out, we were in line. My wife and I were in line to get some of the desserts, and they ran out of some cake. And somebody had a piece of the cake they ran out of, and we were passing by them. They knew there was no more cake. We knew there was no more cake, and they said, "Oh, I'm sorry." Well, I know who it was. it was. It was Brother Mike McGurk. He ain't here. He said, oh, man, I'm sorry. There's no more. But he never offered us his peace. <laughs> and I said, it was the preacher side of me coming out. I said, yep, that's a perfect example of the difference between an apology and repentance. An apology is, oh, I'm sorry, there's no more cake, but it's good. I want my peace. Repentance would have been, oh, man, there's no more cake. Here, you can have mine. It, 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 this, this idea of a covenant. I realize some of you have already re repented and been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, and, and maybe you didn't fully understand this before you did all of that. I, I'm, I'm sorry you didn't understand it before, but I'm here to tell you today that wasn't just a nice little ritual, religious ritual you went through. Baptism, I was, thought I was going to say this a little later, but I'll go ahead and say it now. There's a term that's become kind of popular in Christianity today, and they have baptism Sundays, and a baptism Sunday is for people to demonstrate their public profession of faith. I cannot find one single thing in Scripture that says baptism has anything to do with a public profession of faith. One of the things I find, if baptism is all about a public profession of faith, then when Philip was in the middle of nowhere with the Ethiopian eunuch, and the Ethiopian eunuch said, hey, I want to get baptized, there's some water. If it's about a public profession of faith, then Philip should have responded to him and said, I'm sorry, we got to wait till we get everybody there. We got a t-shirt for you so you can let everybody know I made my public profession of faith. The problem is, and somebody needs to hear me, we have been dumb and down so many things in the Word of God and given them some common frivolous purpose and we've missed the significance of them. Baptism is not just simply about letting the world know a public profession of faith. It is about the entering into a covenant relationship with the God of this world. I'm sorry, there's a really good chance there's somebody here, maybe even a regular member of this church, that you've heard of Baptism Sundays and you think they're a pretty cool thing. I'm sorry, I don't. There's nothing wrong with people getting baptized in a group of people as long as the purpose is right. The other point is you don't need to wait till Baptism Sunday to get baptized. 
When you see the Word of God says you got to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. That's why we've had people come all times of the days and weeks and nights to get baptized because sometimes when you put it off, you change your mind. All I ask, all I ask, all I ask is that if you don't like what I'm saying, just simply measure it by the Word of God. I have no problems with that. If you want to compare me to, don't compare me to what's popular. Because I'm telling you, this whole Baptism Sunday is a very popular thing. And, 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 so, and we, we, so that's why, you know, which is kind of nice because that's more appealing. I'm going to get baptized because just so the world would know I'm identifying with Jesus. No. I'm getting baptized because I'm entering into a covenant relationship. I, I know there are people that are married that don't wear wedding bands, and, and if you don't, and whatever reasons, that your prerogative. But, but I, I wear this, and I wear this because it is a sign that I am in a covenant relationship. It's a, it's, a, it's a sign to others. There's one person I know that thinks I am really handsome. And that's the only one that matters. So I'm not going to presume to think that everybody thinks the same thing she does because love is blind. So I may not be as good looking as she thinks I am, but as long as she keeps thinking that, that's all that matters. So hear me, I'm not presuming to think I'm God's gift to women. I don't think that at all. But the bottom line is, I mean, there may be another one out there somewhere that thinks I'm good looking. So hey, well, just before you... Sorry, I'm taken. Then the other side of it is, there's some days we go through our ups and downs. We have some challenges. We have some disagreements. We, we have some rough times. And I, I, we, as, as everybody knows, we, we celebrated 30 years in, in, in May, 30 years of marriage. And after 30 years of being married, after 30 years, I still find myself subconsciously with my thumb spinning my ring on my finger. I just randomly find myself throughout the day. and the, Because the other purpose of that ring is to remind me when things aren't going real well, I'm in a covenant relationship. When we're not getting along real well, I'm in a covenant relationship. So here we go. When Jesus is not treating me the way I want him to treat me, I'm in a covenant relationship. When he's not answering the prayers the way I'm praying them, I'm in a covenant relationship. And because I'm in a covenant relationship, there's no options to get out of it. I feel that way about my marriage, and I feel that way about my relationship with Jesus. I'm not in this thing called Christianity just as long as he's doing what I want him to do. I made a commitment the first time at about seven years old, and I've renewed that commitment many times since then. I am in a relationship till death parts us. So, I, I kind of all of that to also tell you that in the Old Testament, circumcision was a part of the sign of being in that relationship. Baptism is that in the New Testament. So that's, that's why and that's the context when David says... As he's walking out on that battlefield, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Meaning, who is this guy that is not in covenant with the God of this world? Because I am in covenant with him. My wife asked me right before service, 
Nathaniel asked me last night for my title, and I gave it. Isn't that a cool graphic and screen? And yeah, she asked me before, sir, what did you say your title was? And I told her, and she did about the same thing all of you did. Oh, okay. But, but, nevertheless, what was a couple of lines of that last song? Every giant? How'd that go? I, I'm not backing down from any giant. Why? Why? Why aren't you backing down? Because I know... I know how the story ends. I don't know why no one else was aware and remembering the covenant that they were in. But David was remembering that covenant. And he walked out on that battlefield that day and said, I I know how this is going to end. I realize everybody else was a bit uncertain how it was going to end, but not David, because he knew there is a covenant that has been established, and and what I am doing is in the context of that covenant, so I cannot fail. Can I tell some of you today that are battling anxiety? I'm not talking to... Just guess. There may be some guess, but but I'm talking apostolic. I've never in all my life heard so many born-again people battling anxiety as there is today. You know what? One of the solutions to anxiety is to get a revelation of the covenant that you're in. Because when you get a revelation of the covenant you're in, all that stuff that's causing anxiety is going to begin to subside because I know how it ends. I know what it looks like, but I know how it ends. I know what it feels like, but I know how it ends. Because I've entered into a relationship with a God who cannot and will not fail. How sad is it that all of those other people were unwilling to go out and fight when they were in the same covenant relationship that David was in. Somehow he recognized, I, I, I've got some context for what I'm about to do. Let me tell you something, when you are born again of the water and the Spirit and enter that covenant relationship with Jesus Christ, you want to know what you got available? You want to know the terms of the covenant? And yeah, part of those terms is the responsibility on my side of it. But more so what I'm talking to you about this morning is the things that He has said He will do. When I, invo- when I got myself involved in a covenant relationship with God, He says, all right, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. When I got in a covenant relationship with him, he says, I'm going to stick with you closer than a brother. When I got in a covenant relationship with him, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. When I got in a covenant relationship with him, all things work together for good. When I got in a covenant relationship with him, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. When I got in a covenant relationship with him, I got in a relationship with the one who orders my steps. We want this just to be about punching the clock for an hour or so on a Sunday morning so we can check a box. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding? When I can be in that kind of a relationship with the God of this world, Man, if you missed Thursday night and, and you weren't here or you weren't watching online, I, I tell you, you got to go listen. You got to go watch it. Wow. Wow. I want to talk about some amazing revelation about God and how big and how awesome. And, and that's a whole other area in which we've, 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 we've shrunken God down to some things that are really not even a, in the big scheme of things. They're really no big deal because God's so much bigger than that. I preached it to you a couple of Sunday mornings ago. What a God. What a God. And and when I enter into relationship, a covenant relationship with Him, I now have the right. I, I know this is maybe a little bit 
you know, terminology we're a little uncomfortable using with regards to God. And, and, and obviously, you got to have a right attitude, a right spirit, and all that kind of stuff. But when you get in that covenant relationship with Him, you have a right to expect Him to keep His side of the covenant. He's got a right to expect you. But you have a right... You have a right to expect him. And just like Abraham, he knew when you got in that relationship with him, you didn't have everything necessary to keep your end of it. Scripture says a righteous man falls seven times. A righteous man. That, that, that there is not saying that, that it's literally, up. Oh, Kevin, you've fallen six times. You better not fall again. Or you're, no, what he was saying was, it happens a lot. And I, to my knowledge, I don't think that seven times gave any kind of context. I mean, that's, I don't know, but sometimes that falling seven times is within, is within 60 seconds. It just said a righteous man falls, and it didn't say, to my knowledge, how many times he falls seven times. The prophet, I believe the prophet Micah says, rejoice not against me. Oh, my enemy. And this is the way some of you read that verse. If I fall, I'm going to get back up again. It didn't say if. He said, rejoice not against me, oh, my enemy, because when? If you haven't fallen in a while, just hang on. It's coming. Because until Jesus comes, you're going to fall periodically. And part of the reason you're going to fall is to remind you that you ain't God. And that you need Him. You need His grace. You need His mercy. You need His righteousness. You need His forgiveness. That doesn't mean it's an excuse to just fall and fall and fall. But what that means is when you fall, you can have the confidence to say, I'm going to get back up and I'm going to keep going. Because the one who entered this covenant relationship, relationship with me is not giving up on me so I'm not going to give up on him I, I don't have I don't have the time I mean I guess I could take it but I don't have the, I don't I don't have the time this morning to really dig down into it but it doesn't take a whole lot to show that what happened with Abraham when that uh, smoking furnace and burning lamp passed between those pieces, it doesn't take a whole lot to show how that is the same thing or the New Testament version of this. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, Acts 2 1, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all of the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The word cloven there can mean divide or separate. So that was the offering of the sacrifice. And then the fire came. And all of those people that day were a part of the covenant. Again, I'm not trying to be unkind. And if I make you mad, again, all I'm asking you to do is compare it to the Word of God. Search the Word of God. Not what everybody else says. Search what the Word of God says. But a simple profession of faith is not an entering into the covenant. A simple statement of, I accept the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, it's not how you get in the covenant. It's just not. It's not in the Bible. It's not. The way you get in the covenant is, you got to repent. 
you got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Completely submerged. Not just sprinkled with a little bit of water, but completely submerged. And you got to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the only common evidence we see of that in Scripture is the speaking, in of, speaking of other tongues. That's how you get in the covenant. It's not how you join a church. I, I've said it before and I'm going to keep saying it. Telling people you got to be baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, that's not just our little corner on the market so we can have a something. Burger King's got its Whopper. McDonald's has its Big Mac. That's their unique deal on the market. That's, that's not just so we can be a little different than everybody else. That's because it's, from what I can see in the Scripture, that's what you're supposed to do. And then why wouldn't you want it confirmed? Which in essence is what Abraham was saying. Okay, God, you're making some pretty big promises to me. How can I, how can I count on that? How can I know it's true? Okay, then let me do this. You do your part and I'm going to come and confirm the covenant. When you are baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and you begin to speak with other tongues, that is the confirmation. I'm now in a covenant relationship with God. And if I'll keep my side of it, I've got all of these amazing promises that God is going to keep on His side. Oh, hallelujah. And because He's God, He's not going to break the covenant. Because He's God, He's not going to fail. He's not going to let me down. He can't. I, I, he, he can't. Not because he can't, but because he can't. Because if he does, he no longer is. Hebrews says when, when he could swear by no one else, because there wasn't anybody else greater, he swore by himself. When, when you know, any, anybody ever had to go, um, well, that's a normal common term and it just went. And you have to go sign something and you have to have a witness notary you 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 in 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 some degree you you're you're having somebody greater than you witness they they're certified so when god gets in covenant relationship he looks around for somebody to certify the relationship greater there is no one greater there's no one else to certify the relationship but him and again if he doesn't keep his end of the covenant, he ceases to be. He ceases to be. I got to tell you, he is God. He was God. He is God. He will be God. Therefore, nothing will ever happen for him to break the covenant to no longer be God. Now, you got to hear me. I know most of you know this, but let me remind you and make sure all of you know this. I'm not preaching to you this morning that because you get in a covenant relationship with God or you are in a covenant relationship with God that life is pain-free, problem-free. You're still going to have problems. Jesus said it this way, in this world you will have tribulation. But He said this, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so the significance of that for you and I is when I get in a covenant relationship with Him, the one who overcame it all is the one I'm now in relationship with. And then the next step is I'm not just in relationship with Him, but now He lives on the inside of me. So even if I go through some tribulation, I've got confidence I'm going to overcome. You know, I, 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 it, it, some of you have been around, those of you that maybe you're guests or you've only been here a couple times so far, I'm not going to get bogged down in it, but, but back in February, I think it was February, my wife started, she was the one in the white jacket leading worship. She started having neck issues that progressively got worse and worse and ended up uh, needing to get surgery. And, and uh, it, it was, and I, I know, I know some people 
you don't believe using medicine and going to the doctor, and that's great. If you've got faith, that's fine. But, I mean, I, my opinion is I pray and trust and take Advil. Go to the doctor. I mean, if God didn't want them to learn all the stuff they've learned, and so I, and I'm not, that's not an endorsement for all medicine. Every, I, not, that's not my point. We went, and, and, and I mean, it was uh, Elizabeth and Jacob were engaged, supposed to be getting married in the end of June. And, and uh, we, we went, and, and uh, we had to see, I, I'll never forget it, we had, to, we had to go. Her first appointment with the spine doctor was actually with a, with a physician's assistant. And I remember her saying a couple of times, of course, by that point, she was just really worn out from all of it, saying, you know, this is, we're going to go there, we're going to have to meet with a physician's assistant, and then... And then we're going to have to come back and then find maybe after all that we'll get an appointment. And I mean within just a matter of a few moments sitting there with the physician's assistant. He's like, you need surgery. Well, when can you do it? And then he, he tells us in the, in the process of that, he says, you know, we just had a surgeon. Oh, I think a surgeon on staff is taking a leave of absence. Well, I don't know about you, but if I hear that, I'm thinking, oh, great. That means everything will get backed up even farther. Well, I think we can do it within the next couple of weeks. What? what? Well, if we do it in the next couple of weeks, recovery-wise, how does that work with Elizabeth also graduated college? How does that work with that, being able to go to the ceremony? And then how does that work? You know, it was amazing. The timing of it all was just right. I realize some of you may, we prayed. Anybody was here that Sunday morning when Brother Herring was here and he told us, he looked over at me, which direction is your house from here? I said, I think somewhere over in that way. And everybody turned and lifted you. Man, there was a power. I, I was pretty much expecting to go home and find her rearranging the living room. Went home and it kept getting worse. So, And then this was also kind of amazing to me. She ended up getting COVID after wedding and we were supposed to be leaving on vacation she was she had it rough she was a couple of days down but it was just amazing brother bar because the timing i mean nobody wanted her to be sick she did miss fourth of july we had some very momentous events on the fourth of july i just have to pause for a second and tell you about that have nothing to do with this service and i say recently that if i had a snake in my house i was selling it Y'all need to pray. We've lived there almost four years, or now four years, had never seen a snake, and now within one month, two. And the first one, I know I'm, you don't think I'm a real man because of this. Oh well. I don't like snakes. I don't like any size snake, and I don't care if it's poisonous or not. A snake is a snake. I don't want anything to do with a non-poisonous snake any more than I want to do with a poisonous snake. And I'm standing there on uh, July 4th at my grill, grilling hamburgers. I had grilled most of the hamburgers and hot dogs. And I looked down, and it took several moments. Looking back, it felt like an eternity. It was probably a split second. And, and there's something about six inches long right underneath the knobs where you adjust the flame. There's something sticking out. And all of a sudden I recognize that is a snake sticking its head out. I did not scream. I yelled. You want to know the difference between a scream and a yell? In my opinion, it's the pitch of the voice. With somebody standing a few feet away from me, they had no idea what had happened. They thought that like there was an explosion or something. No, it was just a snake. And then yesterday I come around the I'm blowing some walkways and stuff, right? I come around the front. We had a pest control guy out spraying for spiders and stuff. And he's standing over by the garage, and Jacob is standing right in front of the bay window with, with post hole diggers. Like, what's what's going on? nothing what, what's going on it's a snake are you kidding me and he got up somehow up and we spent 30 minutes I think 
I, I already had the blower, so I had the blower trying to scare him out of there. We had rakes and hoes and axes and all kind of stuff. I don't know where he is. I'm just praying. I'm praying that there is no hole under that bay window that leads into the house. Again, that had nothing to do with the message. I just had to get that off my chest. So. Why was I saying that? Oh, I know. She, she, she missed, you know, but, but my point is, it, even when things aren't going good, when you're in a covenant, you can trust, you know, he's got the timing. He's got everything orchestrated. I'm gonna. I'm more than likely, I'm gonna share a couple of things as a part of my message tonight that I, I heard recently that just once again reminded me of how in control God is, even when you and I are not consciously aware of what He's doing. Why is that? Because I'm in a covenant relationship with Him. And everything about my life is in the context of that covenant. And so therefore, I have the confidence and the assurance. I got a question. You can raise your hand if you want to. If you don't want to, that's fine too. But is there anybody here today? And this is not a trick question. I already used my trick question on you. Is there anybody here today that you've got some situations that you're just you're unsure about how they're going to work out? You're, you're unsure about the outcome of them? Somehow, again, I'm going to say it again. I think I said it earlier when we went to pray for needs. I'm not telling you everything's going to go the way you want it to go, but it's going to go the way that is best for you. And if you are in that kind of a relationship with Him, if you do your part, He does His. Again, I don't know why all those other soldiers in Saul's army were afraid to go out and fight David because they were all a part of the same covenant David was a part of but I guess maybe David just had a little more of an understanding and a confidence in that relationship and therefore he was not intimidated or afraid to walk out on that battlefield because he knew Goliath does not have a covenant on his side. But I have a covenant on my side. I want you to stand, please. Oh, Jesus. That, that's why, again, that's why the enemy wants to try to dumb down so much. That's why he wants to water down so many things because he understands <laughs> the significance of some things. He realizes the, the importance of things throughout the Word of God. And so if he can get us to minimize them, then we lose the significance and the effectiveness of if you're not, If you're in a relationship with God, if you've entered into that covenant... I don't care what it feels like because just because you're in that relationship doesn't mean you will never feel alone. Even Jesus Himself, even Jesus Himself hanging on the cross says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So while we go through those moments where there may be some doubt and questions and uncertainty, if we can just come back to the fact that I am in this relationship that is, this is not just this frivolous thing between God and I. This is not just a take it or leave it kind of thing, but He has committed to this covenant relationship with me and I have committed to this relationship with you. I want you to close your eyes if you would for a moment. I, I want to first of all give an invitation this morning. If you're here today and you've never, you've never entered into that covenant, you've never repented of your sins and been baptized in Jesus' name and been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, 
evidenced by speaking in other tongues. What a great day for you to enter into that covenant. Please hear me. I'm not saying that if you've never done that, that doesn't mean you don't have a relationship with God. I'm not saying that that doesn't mean God hasn't already been working in your life because He, he has, He does, He will. If you've never experienced that, what a great day to do that. But if I could also make an appeal, I, I believe there's some people in this place, you've already done that, you've already entered the relationship, but maybe maybe you've fallen a few times and so you're questioning and doubting, is, is God going to keep his part of the relationship? Or, or maybe you've really missed some of the significance of what it is and battling anxiety and questions and doubts and fears that, that you need the Spirit of the Lord to reassure you today. He's in this relationship with you and you're in it with Him and He's got you. And, and you can look at everything through the context, through the lens of your covenant with Him. So if any of those things, or even if it's not those things, but something else is tugging on your heart, your spirit right now, again, his eyes are closed, just to perhaps make it a little more comfortable, hopefully for somebody that might want to respond, but you feel the Spirit of the Lord talking to you this morning, could I invite you to just step out of your seat right now, make your way down to this altar, if you feel to come and kneel, you can do that, if you want to just come and stand, you can do that, but I believe the Spirit of the Lord wants to confirm some covenants today with some people. I, I believe God wants to give some assurance, some reassurance to some people today that you can trust with confidence and certainty this relationship that you have entered into with Him. This is not just some casual, half-hearted commitment that He's making to you, but Again, he is, he, is, he is resting His deity on the fact that He will uphold His part of the covenant with you. In the name of Jesus, as there's a few more that may be coming, if you don't really feel the need to respond for yourself, can I encourage you to be sensitive to the Spirit of the Lord right now? And let the Lord use you to minister to someone today. Father, I pray that there would be a spirit of revelation and understanding that would come to our minds. I pray, God, that there would be a releasing of our faith with Your Word that we might be profited by. That we might be able to live with the confidence and the assurance because of the relationship that we've entered in with You we can have the certainty that things are working and will work for my good because of this relationship. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. By the power of your Spirit today. Lord, I pray for every, every bit of doubt and fear that may be warring against our minds today, God. That the confidence and certainty that comes from knowing that we've entered into a covenant relationship with you, that, that that would override every one of those fears, every one of those doubts, all anxiety. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. He'll never, He'll never let me down. You'll never let me down, God. You'll never let me down, God. I've got an assurance. I've got a guarantee that you will never let me down. You will never leave me. You will never forsake me. There may be people that neglect me. There may be people who abandon me. There may be people who fail me, but you never will, God. You never will, God. You never will. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You and I don't have to become worthy. We 
don't have to do something to earn getting in that relationship. Bottom line is we can't earn it. We can't become worthy of it. All we can do is be obedient to what he's instructed us to do. That's part of the beauty of his grace and his mercy. In the name of Jesus. Great Lord, great. Great is your your faithfulness is so great. Your faithfulness is sure. Your faithfulness is reliable, dependable, trustworthy. So great, God. Even if I can't quite see it, even if I don't understand it sometimes, it's great. the name of Jesus as those who are praying continue to do so if you need to go or you want to go thank you for being here today God bless you great Lord it's so great it's so great oh yes the midst of all of the storms that may be raging around me. I'm anchored to your faithfulness. I'm anchored to your faithfulness. I'm anchored to your faithfulness, God. No matter how severe the storms may be around me, I'm anchored. I've got an anchor that's going to hold. I've got an anchor that's going to hold. In the name of Jesus.